So let's go ahead and get started. A um, couple of announcements beforehand. The first one is Dr. Perona in the chemistry department has asked me to recommend the synthetic biology course that he will be teaching next term. Uh, should be a lot of fun, although I don't think you're actually going to get to design a circuit to go inside an E. coli cell. So <clears throat> that's the first thing. The second one is we've been asked by the PSU administration, um, due to the fact that it's Pi Day, woohoo, to give everybody pie. No. Um, but if you do over the dean's office, she actually usually does make pie. Um, so if you have a chance to do that. Um, the other thing, of course, is that there are demonstrations going on today starting at 10, which is five minutes before class is over. Um, I will stop lecture at 10. Um, and I'm not allowed to endorse or not endorse whatever is going on. Um, but I was told not to penalize anyone. So there will be not be any clicker questions after 10. And I will stop the lecture at 10. That being said, there's probably, knowing me and knowing what we're doing with clicker questions and your questions, not get through all of the material that I'd like to get through today. So I will actually do an extra recording of the stuff that I don't get through today and post that on YouTube. So that's my plan for today. Um, so we'll be talking about protein methods and nucleic acid methods today, as far as that's concerned. So any questions about that at this point? Pardon? I've never taken one of Dr. Perona's classes, so I have no idea. <laughs> um, the subject material is really cool. Um, but that's, yeah, in terms of how, how he teaches, I'm sure there's a rateyourprofessors.com or some other um, faculty members or your other fellow students who've taken um, Dr. Perona's class. I think he teaches one of the biochemistry, major biochemistry classes. So I'm sure there's some uh, responses to that. OK, so <clears throat> again, today we'll um, finish up talking about some of the protein analyses and then move on to nucleic acid analysis. And again, this is all stuff that you could take a whole course on. And you're in luck. There's a course next term all about nucleic acid methods um, called Recombinant DNA Techniques that Dr. Bartlett does. And he's great. So um, I've actually sat in a couple of lectures and given some guest lectures for him. And you've even heard him here. So you know. Um, so he'll be talking much more in detail about a lot of the cool techniques that we've developed in terms of particularly the recombinant DNA technologies. And um, another quick plug, there's still a few spaces left in the lab and quite a few spaces left in the literature review on viruses. We now have a syllabus for that. So if people are interested in the draft syllabus, let me know. Um, and I can give you some more information on that. So that being said, last time, we talked about SDS page, centrifugation, a little bit about chromatography. Today we're going to continue really briefly talking about affinity chromatography, move on and talk a little bit about proteomics and quote bioinformatics again, a course in and of itself. Um, I'm not going to talk about X-ray crystallography, NMR spectroscopy, and maybe protein-protein interactions at the very end today. That's why I grade or greened them out um, today. But start out talking about fusion proteins. Fusion proteins are basically the way that I would say 90 plus percent of biologists, molecular biologists these days purify proteins. So instead of going through that whole process of ion exchange and size exclusion chromatography, et cetera, people will use recombinant DNA technology that we'll talk about later today and Dr. Bartlett will talk about next term to add a specific tag. And this is a sequence to your protein using recombinant DNA technology that makes it a lot easier to purify. Um, and usually that means some kind of affinity purification. As we talked about last time, that could be antibodies. Um, very often what it is is a metal affinity. So six histidines, it turns out, are really good at binding to nickel. And so adding six histidines to part of your protein is really, really useful. The other thing that this is useful for is localization experiments. If you want to know where your favorite protein happens to be in a cell, if you put one of these tags on it, you can then buy an antibody, which is already specific to whatever that tag is, or some other metal, some other kind of ligand, 
and then specifically identify where that is in the cell. And that's just diagrammed here. Often this will be put at one end or the other, either C terminus of your protein or the N terminus of your protein. Again, through these recombinant DNA techniques that we'll talk about a little bit later. And that tag in the sequence ends up giving you a particular protein sequence here at one end of your protein that, again, be used for purification or for localization processes. I promised last time to show you a bunch of STS page gels of proteins. Um, this is a nice example here. Uh, I've kind of cheated up the top here. I don't know how they did all of these different purifications down here, but this is sort of the general idea. You start out with a mixture of all, in this case, the proteins in a particular cell. That's what you see here in lane one. You've now heated this in the presence of detergent and your DTT or barium to break disulfide bonds. And you see lots of different proteins here. We call these bands of different relative molecular masses. Then you go through various purification techniques, differential centrifugation, ion exchange chromatography, gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography, and affinity chromatography. And you basically go from one of these proteins that was part of this big mixture to hopefully eventually one protein here, which is the protein of interest, the protein that you've actually been looking for. Yeah. So the blip, the blue blip on here basically is the question. How do you know what your activity is? And particularly in something like the ion exchange chromatographer, you're like, oh, it's a tiny little blip. Uh, the way that you do that is you have some kind of test that you can use in terms of a particular activity. So if you're looking for an enzyme, for instance, you'll have an enzymatic activity that you can test for. And you test every single one of these and it's, it's hard to see down here at the bottoms, but you remember the fractions I talked about coming off the bottom of one of your centrifugation tubes? Same thing is true for your chromatography. And fortunately, somebody asked me about this before, you don't have to collect them all by hand now. They're actually machines that will do this for you. Um, and then each of those fractions, you will look and see if it has the activity that you're looking for. We've talked a lot about DNA binding proteins in this class. So you'd be looking for a specific DNA binding protein activity by something like the electrophoretic mobility shift assay. And so that's, and the way that you then will say is, okay, it's this fraction right here, say fraction 12 or whatever it is, um, that has that DNA binding activity or enzymatic activity or whatever it is. So that's what those blue ones are. Any other questions about that? So there's one other kind of protein purification that we haven't really talked about so far, and it's quite important for leading into the next steps here of the two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. This is something called isoelectric focusing. Isoelectric focusing takes advantage of the fact that proteins have different charged amino acids on their surfaces. What are those main charged amino acids? Where's my class list? I can look down, find a name. So these are going to be your acidic and basic side chains. So aspartic acid, glutamic acid, lysines and arginines. And those are going to be differentially displayed on the outside of your protein, which will give it a different charge. This is how ion exchange chromatography works. Again, you've got different charges. So here, instead of binding to some particular surface, what this process does is it sets up a pH gradient. And in that pH gradient, and also in that pH gradient, you have an electric field. And basically what that does is it gets your protein to move to a pH where it has a neutral charge, because that's not going to be moving anymore. And so that's the whole idea of this isoelectric focusing. Um, this is one of the apparatuses that was used to do this. Uh, I found this in an old lab that we were cleaning up a few, actually almost a year ago now. Um, unfortunately, these things break all the time, so they're not um, a wonderful technique. The theory is wonderful. The practice is really a little bit problematic as far as it's concerned. And one of the main reasons it's problematic is that a lot of proteins, at their so-called isoelectric point, so they don't have a net positive or a net negative charge. They have a net neutral charge. 
Proteins then don't interact with water as well. And if they don't interact with water as well, they very often are going to precipitate and bind to themselves and fall out of solution. And if you've ever tried to do chromatography, anything else, precipitation is bad. You really don't like precipitation at all. Yes? How much does your sample have to get prepared in order to do isoelectric So the question is, yeah, how much do you have to prepare your sample before you do isoelectric focusing? They can actually be a pretty dirty sample. You can get lots of resolution or separation of your individual proteins in that. And in theory, again, it's a really, really wonderful technique. Uh, but in practice, it turns out to be, at least for preparative purposes, which is what this box is supposed to be for, not terribly useful. Um, it does turn out to be useful, however, for, great lead in, thank you, <laughs> um, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. So here, we already talked about STS page. STS page is separated based on relative molecular mass because you've included this detergent to give you a pretty uniform charge density. On the other hand, you can also separate based on the isoelectric point of your protein that hasn't been denatured. And so these are just going to be dependent on that three-dimensional structure where the individual proteins are. And so the idea here is you do an isoelectric focusing first. Again, a pH gradient with an electric field. All the proteins are going to go to the point where <clears throat> the right so electric point is. And again, getting back to your question a little bit earlier here, um, very high resolution. You can get, separate literally, you know, tens if not hundreds of proteins um, pretty well um, doing this. And then, that's what we had here, is the isoelectric focusing, basic to acidic. Then what you do is you take your isoelectric focusing, and usually this is done in a thin capillary tube, turn it 90 degrees, and then do SGS page on that. And so all of the proteins at any particular isoelectric point, now you're separating them based on their relative molecular mass. And so any given dot on here, let's take this dot right here, represents a protein that had a particular isoelectric point and a particular mass. And in this process, you can literally separate hundreds of thousands of proteins. Because each of these little dots is going to represent something that had a particular molecular mass and a particular isoelectric point. And it turns out that proteins are diverse enough that this gives you really pretty good separation. And you can literally look at all of the proteins that are produced by a particular cell at a given time using this particular technique. Usually the gels are about this big, and you go incredibly cross-eyed from trying to look at them and particularly comparing them from one condition to another. Um, so that's um, one way, and literally you can go through each of these individual spots and say this spot is different than another spot. Right when we talked about the beginning of gene regulation, I showed you an image with red and blue spots. That's exactly what this is about, is looking at those differential protein expression. And the other thing here is that if you've got some kind of post-translational post modification like phosphorylation, that's going to change the charge of your protein, which is also going to change the isoelectric point. And so you can see something like this group of dots right here, or this group of dots right here, that all have exactly the same molecular mass, but lots of differences in terms of their isoelectric point, it's quite possible that these have different modifications to them. And one of the ways that you can tell what these modifications are is now to use a antibody that will recognize some specific kind of modification. And that's what's called a Western blot. We'll talk a little bit more about blotting later on. We talk about the nucleic acids. But basically the same idea is instead of having a gel, like talk about polyacrylamide, it basically has lots of holes in it, you want to transfer this to a membrane of flat surface. And the reason to transfer to a flat surface is you concentrate whatever you're doing out of that gel onto a flat surface, and secondarily, Whatever is there is now accessible to whatever you put onto that surface. And in this case, it's a antibody which specifically recognizes phosphotyrosine. So, uh, actually, no, phosphothreonine in this case, sorry. You have to remember my single letter code. So, phosphothreonine, an antibody to phosphothreonine, has all of these few dots here. And these correspond to some of the dots that were in this two dimensional gel up here. 
and that says this dot will correspond to one of these guys up here. Uh, but that says that this particular dot is a protein which has been phosphorylated on a 3 and E. And so it's a, just a specific way of identifying some of these spots as having a particular modification. On the other hand, um, identifying each of the spots this way, you don't have an antibody to each of the different kind of modifications. So another way that this is done, and this is much more common, and it's gotten even more common over the last few years, is mass spectrometry. So each of those individual dots or spots that you see on one of these 2D gels, you can literally cut it out with a scalpel and take that particular spot and try and figure out what that spot corresponds to in terms of a protein. Um, the way this is done, again, you cut that particular spot out. It's a protein of some kind. Then you want to figure out what that protein is. And the way that's done is through mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry can look at the mass of an individual protein. That's pretty rare. Um, mass spectrometers are much better at looking at smaller pieces of proteins, so individual peptides. And mass spectrometers have gotten so good, literally over the last 10 years, that a particular peptide is completely unambiguous. And even some of the modifications that happen to some of these peptides in terms of the absolute mass that you get. And so the idea here is you take your protein. This could be a spot on one of your 2D gels. It could also just be a protein that you're working with in your lab. My postdoc took one of these up the hill to HSU to get this analysis done um, earlier this week. So have this protein gets broken into smaller pieces, these individual peptides, and then the mass to charge ratio, which will give you a mass, is determined to extremely high precision. And using those peptides and those masses, you can now compare them to databases of, for instance, all of the human proteins or all of the E. coli proteins, or all of the sulfolobus proteins that you're interested in looking at. And through that process, again, because these are so precise, you can literally absolutely identify whatever protein it is that was in that spot on your 2D gel, or the protein that you're trying to purify and you hope is that virus protein that you've been working on for years in the Stedman lab. So um, that's really the process. And this is the way it's gotten. Again, mass spectrometers have gotten so good now that most people just skip that 2D gel process completely and then just look at all the masses of proteins. And it was at the biology seminar a couple of weeks ago. Um, they were looking at T cells and the various peptides that are made by T cells, tens of thousands of peptides. And they were able to analyze them and figure out exactly which of those peptides were which and which ones are phosphorylated. Just amazing stuff. Um, so that's the main process of mass spectrometry. Another thing that you can do with mass spectrometry is called MSMS, -MS, so basically mass spectrometry squared. Any of these individual peptides that are separated on the mass spectrometer, you can take one of these peptides and then break it down even further and also get sequence information. So the individual amino acids can be determined in that process. Um, so mass spectrometry is really sort of the way it is in terms of protein identification, although there are some issues with that and people interested in that, we can talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so identifying a particular protein is great. And the other thing, sorry, I forgot to mention this, is that this only works in terms of identifying these peptides if you have the information of all of the proteins that could be made by the particular cell that you're looking at. And since we've got all these genome sequences, we've got the human genome sequence, we've got the E. coli genome sequence, we've got the sulfolobus genome sequence, one of my favorites, uh, and it's in looking at all of those sequences in nucleic acids, you can now predict all the proteins that are made and all the peptides that you would make and then do the comparison. So you get the actual peptide molecular mass. You compare it to the database of all of these other theoretical peptides that you could have. And if you find a match, then you know you found that one particular protein. And if you haven't found a match, then it starts to be really interesting. Maybe it's been modified. There's other kinds of you know, other interesting prospects that can happen with that. If you don't have your genome, your favorite genome, your particular protein, uh, then this becomes a little bit more difficult, but fortunately, again, because there are so many 
of these proteins and sequences which are available, you finally get a sequence of your protein, or a sequence of DNA usually, and you have no idea what this protein does. But what you can do is compare it to everything that everyone has ever learned or at least published on all the different proteins in all of these different kinds of databases. And so this is what's called a BLAST search. A lot of people use BLAST as a verb. I think it's completely crazy because what does BLAST stand for? Anybody have any ideas? Exactly, basic local alignment search tool. Um, give the man a gold star. Um, so it's a algorithm that is used to find short pieces. And again, it's a lot like what you see with the mass spectrometer comparing masses. Now you're just comparing sequences. So you take short sequences, compare them all together, and then um, does some good statistics. And the basic message here is when you do one of these blast searches, you'll end up with a number, actually two different numbers. There's a score and an expect value. Um, this is e to the minus 111. This is an extremely small number. Um, and that extremely small number means that the probability of finding this match at random is ridiculously small. And we can see that here in this particular case. We have what we were looking for, which is up on the top here, what was found in the database in the bottom, and in the middle are all of the identical amino acids. And something like this, I forget what the exact, um, the percent identity here is about 70% identical amino acids. What does that mean in terms of the structure? That structure is going to be practically identical. What does that mean about the function? Probably going to be extremely similar. So if the subject turns out to be something that somebody knows about, then you can do the comparison and say, hey, you know, this new protein that I found is probably a DNA binding protein or a particular enzyme, beta-galactosidase, or something like that. And this, again, I put bioinformatics in quotes because this is just one tool of many, many, many different other ones and, again, whole courses that are on bioinformatics. In fact, you can get degrees in bioinformatics, let alone take individual courses, and it's all about sequence analysis. More questions? If you're not going to ask me some, I'll ask you one, right? Okay, so, and again, we'll do this the same um, way we did last time. Make your first vote. Think about it. Then I'll give you a second chance to vote after you had a chance to talk to your neighbors. So, which of the, which of the following methods is best to def? Definitively identify a specific protein. Equilibrium alter centrifugation, SCS page, device selective focusing, mass spectrometry, blast search. And again, make your, make your first best choice, and then we can go from there. Click, think, talk, click. Sounds like people are talking already. How could you? <laughs> I think maybe 45 seconds rather than a minute for this first one would be better. Okay, so we ready to talk? Let's talk.
Okay, are we ready to click again? Yes? No? Yes? Do it. And let's get 100%. Correct. Five. Okay, uh, no one likes the first three, so we won't even bother to talk about those. Uh, blast search versus mass spectrometry. Uh, what's the key to this question? Definitively. So with a blast search, you'll get a good idea, but it's not really definitive. Whereas with mass spectrometry, you will get a definitive, in most cases, and again, this is the best way. I don't say the only way um, to do it. But yes, definitely mass spectrometry is the best way, um, and particularly what's being used for the most part in this day and age. Hey, do we have any more questions about protein methods at this point? Otherwise, I'll switch over and talk about nucleic acid methods. So going once, going twice, yeah. <laughs> So the question is, don't you need to know the amino acid search before you do a blast search? Yes and no. Um, you're going to probably have done the nucleic acid sequence, and then you've back translated it from there um, before you then do your blast searches. But yeah, we can chat much more about that offline. Um, so DNA methods. Uh, we're going to sort of start talking about recombinant DNA. And again, this is a subject for a whole course in and of itself. Sign up for biology 430, 530 next term. Um, the basic idea here is taking DNA from two different organisms and mixing them together, which because we've talked about DNA being the genetic material for all cellular organisms, um, the fact that it's the same stuff means that you can mix and match it, which is really a pretty amazing um, process. I also wanted to Re-mention hybridization. We've talked about hybridization before. It's all about getting two strands that can come apart and then putting another strand together with them, which gives you very high specificity. And this is really important for detecting individual amino acids because you can't see them um, by themselves. Um, part of that has to do with blots, and we'll revisit that whole blot idea that I mentioned from the Western blots already. Um, cloning, this is what we call molecular cloning rather than the somatic cell nuclear cloning, which was Dolly and those cute macaques that we mentioned right at the beginning of regulation. This is literally just making large numbers, or huge quantities, I should say, although large numbers is another way of putting it, of a specific DNA sequence. And so that's the process of cloning we're going to talk about here. A um, little bit about libraries. Um, libraries are just a quick and dirty way to clone is someone else has probably done all the cloning for you. You just need to go and pick out that needle in the haystack that you're particularly interested in. And these are things that you can literally buy um, large quantities of. And then we'll talk a little bit about DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing is, again, been pretty revolutionary in terms of what we understand about molecular biology. And the technology is also moving extremely quickly there. And we'll see how far we get with that technology a little later on. We will talk about PCR a little bit um, earlier. Um, why should we care? Um, well, we now know the human genome. Now, the human genome is, of course, a mixture of multiple different genomes. But everybody in this room is probably going to at least have the opportunity to have their whole genome sequenced because of some of this technology. Now, do you want to have that sequenced? Do you want to know what's in it? How much do we know about what's in it? 
all kinds of interesting questions that get way beyond um, the scope of this course. There's also a um, human genetics course, which is offered here. Um, genetic modification, um, using these tools to actually do genetic medicine, so correct some of the mistakes or mutations that have happened in some genomes, um, how to produce drugs, lots of biotechnology is based on all of this um, research, and then just, again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, take Dr. Bartlett's course next term. What are we going to talk about today is gel electrophoresis, but now not protein gel electrophoresis, but nucleic acid gel electrophoresis, a little bit more about hybridization. Again, it's getting those two strands to come together. And very important about hybridization is not so much getting those two strands to come together, but to be able to detect one of those two strands, and usually the short piece. So we talked about karyotypes, again, way back when, weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Uh, those were fluorescent labels. And so those fluorescent labels for karyotypes then allowed you to differentiate between all the different chromosomes. You could have each chromosome be a different color. Um, so we'll talk about how people go about labeling these particular, usually short, nucleotide sequences. Um, the blots, again, we've mentioned before. Recombinant DNA, it's really about the restriction endonucleases, who cared about bacterial viruses until people figured out that restriction endonucleases were a ridiculously useful thing to use and basically started the whole biotechnology industry. Um, and a lot of that also has to do with what we call vectors. I know that George mentioned plasmids in his CRISPR-Cas talk. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about plasmids. These are basically extra chromosomal elements of double-stranded DNA, which are much easier to work with than whole genomes. Now, I'll talk a little bit about libraries. Again, the library idea here is that just like that you know, big building over there with all the books in it. Um, anyone go there anymore? No. I was actually just over there for the 3D printer. They've got a really nice 3D printer over there. Um, but <clears throat> the idea here is that basically everything is in the library. You just need one of those particular books. So all of the genes, the nucleic acids that you happen to have in a particular organism, that's that one book that you're trying to find. And usually how do you find it is through cloning or these um, hybridization techniques. Um, polymerase chain reaction, how many of you have not heard about PCR? How many of you could talk about PCR on a test? Okay, so we'll go over PCR in a little bit more detail. The polymerase chain reaction also has really revolutionized thinking about DNA, biotechnology, et cetera. And if you want to say a good laugh at some point, read Carrie Mullis' um, Nobel Prize acceptance speech completely crazy. Um, so he's the fellow who's credited with inventing PCR. As, as, just like Columbus, though, probably the last person to actually invent PCR. Um, and then we'll talk about DNA sequencing, how you go from this to actually a stretch of C's, A's, T's, and G's. And then, again, we talked about bioinformatics a little bit already. And then to some um, extent, so a lot of the reason for doing Recombinant DNA in the first place is to get large amounts of any particular protein that you're really interested in. People call this overexpression. And if you want to do biochemistry, you want to do structural biology, um, you really need large amounts of one particular protein. And you can try and get that from tissue. Um, one of the previous jobs that I worked in, we actually had horse pancreas, and we were trying to purify proteins from horse pancreas. It was not very much fun. Uh, but if you can use these recombinant techniques, you can often use other ways of making a lot of these proteins. But first, I wanted to talk about nucleotide gel electrophoresis. One of the really nice things about nucleic acid is, unlike proteins, nucleic acids have a really uniform charge density. Every base pair has two phosphates that are associated with it. So you don't need to make a charge on your nucleic acid. It's automatically what kind of charge? negatively charged. And so it's always going to migrate in an electric field from your negative pole to your positive pole. So that's great. Um, and you can also then, just by setting up what kind of gel you have between your negative pole and your positive pole, you can separate these nucleic acids just literally based on their lengths. And there are really <clears throat> sort of three main ways that people use to separate different nucleic acids. 
There are high resolution and lower resolution techniques. The high resolution techniques where you use acrylamide gels can literally separate nucleic acids one base at a time and will actually give you single base resolution, which is really pretty amazing. Um, and that you can see over here with our acrylamide gel right here. So this particular nucleotide strain, um, stretch is 10 nucleotides, that's 11, that's 12, that's 13, that's 14, that's 15, et cetera. So um, these techniques, and you know, people work them out over a number of years to try and get this um, to happen. Now, this is great, but you can maybe get a couple of hundred nucleotides this way. Um, how big is our genome? Haptoid, about three billion. So this is not a terribly useful way to be looking at it. And even if you're talking about the uh, plasmids or something like that, it's going to be thousands of nucleotides in length. So you need other ways of separating larger nucleic acids from each other. And that's usually done with agarose gel electrophoresis, which we have here. This is literally separating relative to hundreds or thousands of nucleotides difference, up to about 10,000. And then there's this really fun technique called pulse field gel electrophoresis. Um, this is actually not separating so much based on the absolute length of your molecule. It has to do with how rapidly this molecule can come apart and go back together. So pulse field gel actually literally changes the, the field back and forth from the top and the bottom, and it allows your you know, poor nucleic acid to get stretched out in one direction, then it's stretched out in another, stretched out in the other direction. The longer that nucleic acid happens to be, the longer it takes to go back into its normal form in the other direction. It turns out you can use this to separate really large nucleic acids from each other, and literally billions, well not billions, but millions of bases. So this particular one is 2.5 million bases. And you can separate at least in some cases smaller chromosomes um, through this technology. So this is hundreds of thousands up to millions of base pairs in length using this um, pulse field um, process. So this is great, this is wonderful, you can separate all of these things, but how do you detect what you've separated? Um, and this is where we come to the staining process, you know, stains, the protein stains developed over centuries to stain proteins, to stain various different carbohydrates, etc. People didn't develop ways of staining DNA over hundreds and thousands of years. So how do we do that? A couple of different ways. Um, probably the most well-known of these are the intercalating dyes. So what does intercalating mean? It means that these dyes stick into your nucleic acid, and when they're stuck into the nucleic acid, they fluoresce. Um, the best known of these is ethidium bromide, but there are a number of other ones as well. That sticks into your nucleic acids. Once it sticks in there, again, it fluoresces. If it's not stuck in there, it doesn't fluoresce. And so that's what you can see here for the two agarose gels. We have this ethidium bromide that's been stuck into that particular DNA and fluoresces, but only at that particular position where you have DNA. If it's not associated with DNA, it doesn't fluoresce. Um, that's great if you've got big pieces of DNA. If you've got really short pieces of DNA like this, classically what's always been used is radioactivity because radioactivity you can detect just by putting a piece of photographic film on top of your gel in this case, and then it will become exposed due to the radioactivity. And that's what's used for these smaller ones here. Now, <clears throat> this being said, we've got, you know, we can just identify these based on our relative size here. Um, intercalation and radioactivity is not specific. So if we wanted to identify one of these particular nucleic acids, that's the one that we're interested in, then we need to do blots. So the blotting process shown up here at the top of the slide is you have your gel. This again could also be a protein gel just as much as it could be a nucleic acid gel. And then you need to transfer what's in this gel, which is a thick piece, onto a membrane, which is our green piece here. And there are, again, two reasons to do that. One is it's concentrating. It's getting everything that was in that thick gel onto one particular surface. And then it's also accessible to whatever you put onto that surface. So process, you actually build these sandwiches. Um, go to molecular biology labs. You see all the paper towels. They've been actually, you go to the bathrooms in the molecular biology lab. You can't find any paper towels because they've stolen them all to uh, do all their blots with. 
Um, so basically what you're doing is you're pulling the liquid through the gel onto this surface. That surface you can now try and detect what you're particularly looking for. And that detection, we already talked about antibodies for proteins. You can actually have antibody-specific DNA sequences, but that's really rare. Um, usually you'll do hybridization, which again is taking your specific DNA that you're interested in, usually a short piece. You're trying to find a bigger piece that so that short piece is in. So multiple different kinds of blots. We have northern blots. Northern blots are when you're separating RNA. I already mentioned protein gels are called western blots. Why are they called all these strange you know, compass directions? They're actually called these strange compass directions because DNA-DNA hybridization was by a fellow named Southern. And so the original one of these was DNA-DNA hybridization. It was Southern's. I said, oh, Southern's, okay, that's great. Well, we've got some of them with, DNA, with RNA now. What are we going to call it something different? Okay, we'll call it Northern's. Came with some of the proteins. Okay, we'll call it a Western blot. Um, as far as I know, there are no Eastern blots, but if you come up with one, you know, let me know what that would be. Um, so <clears throat> the whole idea here, again, is you've got a separated mixture of your nucleic acids. You want to identify one or a few of those, and you'll do that by hybridization. And that's what's supposed to be shown down here on the lower right here. This one, this one, and this one are the particular bands that you're interested in looking at. Hybridization, again, anytime you've got a mixture of different molecules, all of these green ones here, you want to find out which one and usually the size here is A, you put in some DNA, in this case, that's going to base pair with A. As long as you have some way of detecting this A, you can then figure out which one of these turns out to be A. And again, this is DNA, DNA is going to be Southern's, DNA, RNA is going to be a Northern. Um, RNA, RNA is used a little bit, but not so much in <clears throat> blotting purposes. But you have to have a way, and this is your probe, for figuring out and dis literally detecting this particular sequence. How is that done? Um, it's usually done through, well, historically anyway, back when I was doing these things, uh, using radioactivity, but you can also use non-radioactive labels and usually fluorescent labels is what people use these days. But the, the process is exactly the same. There are really two different ways of labeling nucleic acids body labeling and end labeling, and body labeling is just labeling the middle, and end labeling, not surprisingly, is labeling the ends. We'll start with end labeling. What kinds of ends do you have in nucleic acid? One end, the other end, five prime and three prime. So you can put a label at the five prime end, you can put a label at the three prime end. Um, polynucleotide kinase is really good at labeling at the five prime end of your DNAs and kinase. So kinase is what do they do to put phosphates on? You use radioactive phosphate in this case. Um, if you want to label at the three prime end, you use something called terminal transferase, which will put a radioactive label at the three prime end. Or in this day and age, usually people just buy their nucleic acids and say, please put a label on it. And they click that box when, they label, when they're ordering them online. Uh, but you can also use these animatic techniques. Um, another one, um, and the body labeling, so this is, is okay, but you're only going to get a label at one end of your particular DNA. And so if you have a lot of that, that's fine. But if you don't, you're actually not going to have a very strong label or something that's going to be easy to detect. And so if you want to get something which is screamingly hot, as we always used to call it um, in terms of radioactive labels, or something that's got a large amount of labels associated with it, it's usually a much better idea to do body labeling. And so how do people do body labeling? This has to do with using DNA polymerases, which will incorporate nucleotides that have a label associated with them. So it could be a radioactive label, it could be a fluorescent label. And the favorite DNA polymerase that people like to use for this is DNA polymerase 1. Why? <laughs> Olivia thinks she knows. Um, it doesn't have an exonuclease. I think it actually has got a lot of exonucleases. 5 prime to 3 prime and 3 prime to 5 prime. Pardon? So what's going to happen if you talk about DNA polymerase 1? DNA polymerase 1 is usually used for getting rid of Okazaki fragments, right? 
So the reason it's good for getting rid of Okazaki fragments is because it's got this you know, 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity as well as the 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase activity. So what that means is if you have a tiny little place on the DNA where DNA polymerase 1 can start, it will start to replicate, but it will be chewing up nucleotides in front of it and laying down nucleotides behind it. So whatever those labeled nucleotides behind it are, those are going to be incorporated. And you just have to have a tiny little break in your DNA. And any time you purify DNA, you're going to have tiny little breaks in it. So if you just put in DNA polymerase 1 and labeled nucleotides, you will get labeled DNA. Now, of course, the thing with DNA polymerase 1 is it's non-processive, so it'll fall off. Um, but this will give you really nice labeling. So DNA polymerase 1, because of the exonuclease activities, um, is a really good way. And then you can also use DNA polymerase 1 that doesn't have proofreading activity. So um, a particular mutant, which is in, by far and away the best way to do these kinds of labeling. So you've got these labels. Um, again, good old school, we use radioactivity. Um, people don't like radioactivity anymore. So lots of times people have moved away from radioactivity and now use nucleotide analogs. And this is just one example of one of these nucleotide analogs. Here we have this regular part of your nucleotide triphosphate here. Here's this thymidine, except it's got this humongous extra piece hanging off of the end of it. Um, and this extra piece hanging off the end of it means that you can incorporate this nucleotide pretty nicely. It makes nice base pairs, but then there's this extra thing hanging off of that. And that extra thing turns out to be something either which is fluorescent or something which is really easy to identify through the process of biotin. You can also have antibodies, etc. cetera. Um, so it turns out that a lot of DNA polymerases can actually incorporate these bizarre nucleotides that have these extra things hanging out in the major groove. And people have now developed specific polymerases that are really good at incorporating these extra nucleotides to them. So that's probes and hybridization. We ready to think, click, talk, click? Yes? I know, it's, it's way too many things to do here. So to detect a specific RNA binding protein using a blot, you should consider A, northern, southern, western, northwestern, southwestern. Everybody got their first, first guess in? <clears throat> Talking time. So turn to your neighbor and tell them why you chose what you chose. Okay, 
It's getting quiet again. Time to vote. Try again. Ten, five, we still have differences of opinion here. Uh, nobody likes southern blots because that's DNA, DNA. So that makes sense. It's really interesting. So I could see your scores the first time around, and, and it's, got, it's shifted a lot from northern blot to western blot which means maybe it should have shifted even further and gone to a northwestern blot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people didn't think this was a thing and why they didn't pick it. Um, I've actually done lots of southwestern blots myself. There's also something called a far western blot where you have these extra things. So this is, I'm trying to get people to think sort of outside the box. <laughs> to go with things he talked about. Well, that's, the idea is to extend going that. Yes? Uh, so we thought that Stedman couldn't come up with other options. Well, sometimes that's true. Other times it's not true, which means that I'm trying to keep you honest, and, and you can try and keep me honest as well. Okay, so Northwestern is, is what, I was, what I was looking for on this. Now, that being said, if I had just done the first round, there would have been like 5% of people who got gotten this. So I guess some learning is happening in these discussions. The idea is it's supposed to be about learning. It's not supposed to be about testing, right? It would be nice if that's the way our education system worked. Yeah, so why, why would a Western blot be incorrect? Maybe that's a better way of stating that question. So the Western blot depends on having an antibody to the protein that you're looking for. It's so using the antibody to detect it with. If you're using an RNA to detect it with, that would be your northern that you're using to detect it with. So Western blots are going to be a, a protein that you're recognizing with an antibody. Yes. Yes, no, maybe. No. <laughs> no is, is the answer. Uh, okay, so uh, given that we've got about another five minutes until 10, um, we're probably going to talk about restriction and nucleases and not discuss DNA sequencing in class, but I will post um, some lectures um, on that. I'll just continue my lecture when I get back to my office here. So um, restriction and nucleases. Uh, restriction and nucleases, what do they do? They recognize and cut specific DNA sequences. So we talked about exonucleases, endonucleases are going to cut in the middle of your DNA. Um, where do restriction endonucleases come from? They restrict the infection of certain bacteria from certain viruses. And so it's all about the virus infection and protecting from the virus infection. So not unlike the CRISPRs that George talked about um, last week. So um, restriction and nucleases bind to these sequences and will cut them. Um, this is great and wonderful for protecting against viruses that will infect the cell, but what about your own genome? How do you protect your genome from getting cut by these restriction and nucleases? The way that you protect it is exactly the same way that you know that you've replicated your genome, which is how? DNA methylation. So DNA methylation 
of the bacterial genome protects it against the restriction in enucleases, and the viral genome, when it comes in, gets cut because it's not methylated. Of course, viruses have evolved to methylate their genomes in other ways as well. Um, but that's the basic idea. Um, we have a restriction in AOKs that binds to almost always a palindromic sequence. So what do we mean by palindromic sequences? George talked about this as well. It's a sequence which is the same on one strand as it is in the other strand. So here, 5 prime GAATTC, 5 prime GAATTC. And what this means is it's also a symmetrical site. Symmetric probably means that you're likely to have dimers which bind to it. Almost all restriction nucleases are dimers. You're going to bind to these sequences and then cut them. They can cut in various different ways, um, so-called blunt cutting, which is where you cut both strands at the same place. You can also have those that will have five prime overhangs or three prime overhangs. Here's a case of a five prime overhang because this single stranded piece here has a five prime end here and a little single stranded piece. Of course, in the opposite strand, the same thing. Five prime over here. You can also have those that have three prime overhangs. That's this example down here at the bottom. Here, the three prime end is single stranded, and the three prime end is single stranded here. Um, in the textbook, they say four to eight base recognition sequences, these palindromic sequences. That's, again, as always in biology, an oversimplification. Um, and if you are interested in more, learning more about this, you should go and take a look at the link at the bottom of the page, our rebase, restriction and nuclease database at newenglandbiolabs.com. This is a company that was partially started by one of the people who discovered these restriction endonucleases in the first place, and one of my favorite biotechnology companies. So why are restriction endonucleases so useful? The reason they're so useful is that everything is made of DNA, at least all cellular organisms. So you can take a particular DNA and cut it with your favorite restriction endonuclease, take another DNA and cut it with your favorite restriction endonuclease, and these things can be put together. This is these ends, these ends are going to be compatible to each other, they can base pair, and then all you need to do is put in a DNA ligase, and you end up with a recombinant DNA molecule. It's just DNA that's come from two different places, red and black in this particular case. Originally, this was done with a, let's see, a human, I believe, a simian DNA virus and a bacterial DNA virus. Oops, wrong direction there. So why do we like to do this? Really useful for DNA cloning. And again, the idea here with DNA cloning is you want to make many copies of a particular DNA. Maybe it's a DNA that has your favorite protein, which is being in that particular sequence. Now you can use it to make large quantities of that particular protein. So this takes advantage of these so-called vectors or plasmids. Plasmids are small, double-stranded, circular, sort of mini chromosomes, I like to think of them, which over time people have put multiple different recognition sites for restriction endonucleases into them. And so in this case, we have what's called the multiple cloning site, MCS, is lots of sites for your favorite restriction endonuclease. So you cut this with your favorite restriction endonuclease, then you put your favorite DNA, cut it with the same restriction endonuclease, put it into the plasmid, and you can use this to make many, many copies of your favorite gene. This is a bit of a, I don't know what the right adjective would be, um, complicated process, so very often people do this for you. They'll take the whole human genome, chop it into little pieces, and put them in plasmids for you, and then you can literally buy these and pull them out of the individual bacteria. Uh, let's see. One more minute, or are we going to have our walk out now? One more minute. I just want to talk about, really briefly, the cDNA libraries. The whole idea of a cDNA library, complementary DNA. The complementary DNA is a complement to the RNA which is being made. And so in this case, you have a reverse transcriptase that will make a DNA copy of an RNA, which gets rid of all of the introns 
So it's just a messenger RNA that you're looking at here. So libraries you can buy are going to be cDNAs and genomic libraries. Welcome to the extended mix of Lecture 24, Molecular Biology, Winter 18. Wanted to continue where we left off at 10 today, just cover a few more things before um, we finish up for the lecture for today. Um, I just got to overview of our libraries, which I mentioned right before we finished. Um, there are really two different kinds of libraries. We have genomic DNA libraries and cDNA libraries. The idea of the genomic library is you literally chop up your favorite genome into smaller pieces. It could be restriction endonucleases, could be other things, and then each of those individual fragments you clone into a plasmid. And now you have this huge mixture of different DNAs, each of them in an individual plasmid. And one of the things we didn't talk about was the transformation. I'll talk about that in just a second, um, how each of these plasmids ends up in one cell. And then from each of those cells, you can make lots and lots of that one particular piece of DNA. The crucial aspect of this, of course, is in your library is figuring out which ones of these DNAs are the ones that you're interested in. And usually this is figured out through hybridization processes. The other kind of library, as I mentioned also briefly before we finished, was the cDNA or complementary DNA library. And here, what you're looking at are DNA copies of all of the RNAs which are present in a particular cell at a particular time. The big advantage of this is that all of these messenger RNAs, you have a cDNA copy of that, you're missing all of the entrons, etc. If you're looking for regulatory sequences, you're never going to find them in here. Um, but if you're looking for coding sequences here, this is going to be much more complex because, of course, coding sequences, particularly in things like the human genome, there's a lot fewer of them. So once we have these libraries. Again, we need to figure out which of these particular plasmids has the DNA that we're interested in. And usually we'll do this through hybridization, but if you just have one copy of the DNA in all of these literally thousands or tens of thousands of plasmids, um, you need to really pick out the right one. So usually you do this by hybridization. You can either do this in the individual DNA, but that doesn't work terribly well. Usually what happens is you take this particular plasmid and you put it into usually a bacterial cell. One of the things that I didn't mention when we talked about the vector is they have all of these multiple cloning sites for lots of sites that you can put your favorite DNA into with different restriction and nucleases, but they have two other very important things. One of those is a replication origin, so this can replicate now in E. coli. The other one is an antibiotic resistance gene, and that antibiotic resistance gene basically means that any bacteria that don't have a plasmid in them are going to die, whereas those that have a plasmid in them will actually be able to grow in the presence of this antibiotic. And so now you can grow the cells that have these DNAs in them, and then usually you'll screen for your own particular DNA of interest, again, usually through hybridization processes, um, sometimes PCR as well. So now you've got lots of your bacteria that have lots of copies of this particular gene in them, you can make many, many copies of that particular gene um, just by growing these E. coli, again, in the presence of antibiotics, and get many, many copies of those genes. But very often, if you happen to have this piece of DNA encoding the protein that you're particularly interested in, then what you want to do is now, as we say, express that particular protein. So the way that that happens, you have a particular kind of plasmid. This, again, same kind of double-stranded circular DNA has a particular restriction in a nuclease site that you can put your favorite protein into, also has an origin of replication and antibiotic resistance. But the big difference here is there's a particular promoter sequence which you put just upstream of your particular DNA coding sequence. And then, in this particular case, this is a promoter which is recognized by a bacterial viral polymerase called bacteriophage T7, turns out to be a really good polymerase, um, can bind to this promoter, 
and make a lot of RNA. Those RNAs get made into proteins. And this is a particular example of that. Here we're looking for this particular protein. This represents that green DNA, which we put in here in the first place. Here, um, 25 degrees is a low temperature. You're not getting expression. You raise the temperature 42 degrees. At 42 degrees Celsius, this T7 polymerase is made, and you end up with a lot of this DNA helicase, which you then go through and purify later on. Often this will also say have a tag at one end, so you can do affinity purification, etc. So that's the classic cloning kind of technique, again, getting these out of libraries usually. Another way that people do this is using the polymerase chain reaction. And I just wanted to really briefly talk about the polymerase chain reaction here. Um, polymerase chain reaction is completely dependent on DNA polymerases and particular small, what are called oligonucleotides, which you can literally buy, that are going to be complementary and hybridized to the two strands of DNA, which you're going to amplify. So the first step here is you heat up your DNA. These two strands are now separated. This is your denaturation step. You anneal your primers. Annealing is just hybridization. So you cool this down to a particular temperature. These two primers are going to bind. Now you have a 3'OH and a template, a 3'OH and a template. The DNA polymerase can extend all the way through this DNA molecule. And this DNA molecule can actually be really pretty big. Um, and it will extend all the way, hopefully, past where you had this primer binding site to start with. After this first cycle happens, then you basically repeat the whole process. Heat up the DNA to separate the two strands, anneal the primers, do more synthesis, etc. And the more that you do of this, what's going to end up happening is the original DNA, your original DNA template, this gray one, there's going to be less and less of this relative to the other DNAs which are being amplified. So you're basically copying these DNAs which have been copied already. And this is really important because eventually you'll get to a template which starts with the primer at one strand and then will end at where the primer is in the other strand. So you'll eventually start to make more and more of this particular DNA um, shown here in the yellow blobs, which now is your double-stranded DNA of exactly the length between these two primers. One thing to really importantly notice here is that it's only after this third cycle that you finally end up with these pieces of DNA which are exactly the right size that you happen to want for your particular reaction. Unfortunately, we missed the next clicker question. That next clicker question would be in order to clone the DNA that encodes your favorite eukaryotic enhancer binding protein and add restriction endonuclease sites to the gene before adding it to your expression plasmid, you should clone directly from a genomic library, clone directly from a cDNA library, do PCR in a genomic library, do PCR in a cDNA library, or, you know, this is literally one of those questions that I said to give up on. Um, the answer here is that you want to do PCR. Why do you want to do PCR? Because you do PCR on your DNA, and that particular primer can include a restriction endonucleus uh, site on your primer. And so when you amplify from your primer, you're going to end up with a restriction endonuclease there. So you end up having to do PCR here using PCR because you're adding this particular restriction enzyme. The other thing is the question is you want to use a genomic library, do you want to use a cDNA library? You want to do a cDNA library because you're looking at your eukaryotic enhancer binding protein. Eukaryotic enhancer binding protein genes almost always are going to have introns in them. And so if you want want to express this um, gene and cloning that DNA for the encoding sequence, you really want to use a cDNA library. So now I want to talk about probably the most important potentially topic of this whole course, which is DNA sequencing. Um, this is the original DNA sequence which was used um, to determine the sequence of a particular DNA. We already mentioned one of the breakthroughs that was really important for this, and that was these polyacrylamide gels, which have resolutions of individual bases relative to each other. So this piece is, in this case, one nucleotide long, this one's two nucleotides, three nucleotides, four nucleotides, five nucleotides, six nucleotides, etc. And so this development of the polyacrylamide gel was really, really important. And again, small at the bottom, 
large at the top. To do these kinds of gels, what you have to do is now include a DNA polymerase. And the way that this happens is through the so-called dideoxy um, or chain termination technique. Um, and all that you do here is you do a DNA polymerization reaction with normal nucleotides with your 3 prime OH on them and so-called dideoxy nucleotides that have no OH at the 3 prime position. If there's no OH at the 3 prime position, the DNA polymerase can't extend this particular fragment. So to do one of these reactions, you have a mixture of normal nucleotides and then a small amount of one of the four dideoxy nucleotides. In this case, it's dideoxyadenine. So you have a single-stranded DNA, you have a primer, and the DNA polymerase will extend along this template with normal Watson quick base pairing until it incorporates one of these rare dideoxy nucleotides, at which point the polymerase stops. You have multiple reactions, multiple templates that are going on here. So you'll end up with a whole mixture of sequences, some of which will have stopped at this A, some of which will have stopped at this A, some of which will have stopped at this A, some of which will have stopped at this A. And it's a whole mixture now of, of different pieces of DNA of different length, all of which have stopped at dideoxy A. Now you do three more reactions where you use dideoxy T, dideoxy C, and dideoxy G again in small amounts of these individual nucleotides. So you'll end up with this first reaction where everything is stopped at an A, the second reaction where everything is stopped at a T, third reaction where everything is stopped at a C, and the fourth reaction where everything is stopped at a G. Now you take each of these reactions, you put them onto a gel, the dideoxy A, dideoxy T, dideoxy C, and dideoxy G, these all will have ended at one particular nucleotide. So here, your dideoxy G reaction all ended at G. And now literally all you have to do is read from the bottom to the top of the gel. This would be A, T, G, T, C, A, G, T, C, C, A, G. So that's your primer. The other thing you have to be sure that you do is label your individual nucleotides. Originally, this was done radioactively, and then later, this was done using fluorescent dyes. And so that's what is currently used for this dideoxy sequencing reaction. Instead of having a polyacrylamide gel where you have four different reactions that you put into different lanes, now you have, this is exactly the same um, gel here, the same idea, again, dideoxy G, dideoxy A, dideoxy C, and dideoxy T. Again, all these finish at different positions, but now each of these dideoxy nucleotides has a different fluorescent tag on it. And so what this means is you can now do all of these reactions and run them all together in one particular gel. Usually this is done in a capillary gel electrophoresis. And so here is all of these, this would have been four different reactions, all now run together, put them all in one reaction, and you run this gel. And now instead of reading them off of a uh, gel like this, which you have labels, now you have a laser at the bottom of your gel, which literally will detect, okay, this first one to come off is a C the next one to come off because it's a cyan color. The next one to come off is green, that means it's an A. The next one to come off is an A because it's red. The next one to come off is a G because it's black. And this just ends up being plotted as we have up here. So first you saw a T, then you saw a T, and again, all coming off the bottom here. So these are the smallest ones going further and further on to some of the larger ones. And this is still exactly what is used for lots of DNA sequencing reactions. We use these DNA sequencing reactions all the time. Usually it's done by a company because they have economies of scale um, and can do these all really well. So this is great. The big downside of this, however, is that the vast majority of these kinds of reactions can only get to about 400 nucleotides before they all start to run into each other and you can't see any kind of resolution. So these peaks start overlapping with each other. Um, and so what you end up with is a whole collection of 
400-ish base pair pieces of DNA, but you care about putting all of these DNAs together. So the way that this happens is you get lots and lots of DNAs, and these are put together in, you know, all these DNAs are made in a random fashion. And then you sequence all of these, you get 400 base approximately pieces of each of these pieces of DNA. And then in the computer, you look for areas where these sequences actually overlap with each other. So you've done a DNA sequence here, here's a DNA sequence, and it turns out that this GTTCA, GTTCA lines up with each other. And so you know that this original piece that you started with, these two pieces overlap with each other, and then you have a complete or what people will call a contiguous piece of DNA or a contig. This process, breaking up DNA into lots of pieces, sequencing each of these individual pieces, then putting them back together is called the assembly process. Once you've done an assembly of a long piece of DNA, this can be up to the whole human genome size, then you can predict the different genes that you have there um, just by knowing the genetic code and knowing your amino acid sequences um, together with the nucleotide sequences, and then finally you can put these sequences together and start to compare them to each other. This, in an even larger scale, was done for sequencing the whole human genome, and that was different pieces. Now, instead of DNAs, which were had sequences that were similar to each other, what they did was take large DNAs. These are called BACs. They're bacterial artificial chromosomes. These are literally hundreds of thousands of base pairs, but again, a plasmid just like we had before, antibiotic resistance, origin of replication. These then were cut with various different resection endonucleases, shown here as A, D, B, C, and E. And just by each of these individual clones, again, purified from an individual bacterium, they saw, okay, this one was cut and gave certain size pieces, again, through agarose gel electrophoresis to see how big they were. This piece of DNA was cut by these restriction endonucleases and gave these sizes. And again, through the jigsaw puzzle, we were able to make this whole segment of the human genome. And then each of these pieces, these bacterial artificial chromosomes, were chopped up into smaller pieces, and those were then sequenced using this dideoxy sequencing technique. There are a number of other DNA sequencing techniques, um, mostly called next generation DNA sequencing techniques, that I will leave you to read about in the textbook. They won't be on the exam. Um, and if anyone is interested, I'm more than happy to talk to them about these particular processes. So on Friday, we will have our review session as usual. So there'll be no new material on Friday, and the exam will be on Tuesday. Again, I repeat, Tuesday at 8 o'clock in the morning in our normal lecture hall. See you on Friday, or if not on Friday, definitely on Tuesday morning, 8 a.m.